It's an interesting room you got here. I heard it's called a tennis room, was it? Um, so, yes, I'm Nils Faro. I come from Oslo and Akershus University College, as it's called now, uh, where I teach uh, at our program in uh, uh, Archivistic Lab and Information Science. And uh, I had the pleasure of having Thomas as one of my students in the field, in a subject called digital documents, I think. Um, <coughs> what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, semantic web and linked data, which are two uh, sides of one coin. And uh, let's see here. I'm going to start with introducing the semantic web and what is the purpose of a semantic web. I'm going to spend some time uh, showing the basic uh, technologies or standards used for uh, getting data out on the semantic web. Then I'm going to say a few words about the problem of interoperability of data and how we could use semantic web technologies for sharing that problem. And then I'm going to introduce the idea of linked data as the solution for uh, getting data out of uh, uh, internal systems in into the semantic web as a way of, uh, of uh, solving uh, bigger problems. Uh, the semantic web is defined here as a common framework that allows data to be shared and reused across applications, enterprises and community boundaries. It's based within the World Wide Web Consortium and it's built upon the, the ordinary web infrastructure. The infrastructure that we'll use, I'll return to that in a little while, uh, but first we need to see how can we develop data uh, or model data to make it available on the semantic web. The problem that we have in using purely the ordinary web for uh, distributing data are several. The ordinary web creates too much noise when you want to query uh, for uh, for information there. Of course, for on a daily basis, there's no problem for you to use, uh, use uh, for example, Google to, to find the information that uh, is necessary for solving simpler tasks. But if you wish to use the web infrastructure for finding exact data about things and coupling data and, uh, and making analysis of it, it gets much harder. And that's why we uh, get the problem of noise. We get the problem of having internal systems that don't talk together. And we got the problem of costs of communication. The first problem, the noise problem, can perhaps be solved if we get more sophisticated <laughs> IR systems up and running. So more sophisticated information retrieval systems that uh, use make use of more sophisticated markup. So rather than having Google as a search engine uh, uh, exploiting HTML as markup for, uh, for uh, retrieving documents, we would need to have some kind of perhaps XML language for used as markup and then have systems that are able to interpret the XML languages and collect the exact data from, uh, from uh, such uh, sources and combine them. There are lots of experiments doing uh, that kind of uh, uh, um, creating such systems. And I've been involved in uh, something called the INX project where we try to use, let's see if I already have it here. Yeah, where we try to use <coughs> XML encoded data 
and see if we can create uh, search algorithms and index algorithms that are able to actually exploit that we have a uh, semantic markup. So here is a XML document which uh, looks like this. If we uh, blow it up, is that the right one? See? So XML is uh, a standard for marking up text. So just like you, uh, when you look at source codes for HTML pages, you it look something like this, not as complex as this, but uh, but uh, something similar to it. And if we are able to grab hold of parts of these uh, elements that are uh, in a way more uh, semantic, that can be more semantic than than the standard HTML can, then it's possible to say that, okay, I query for bridge information, and then I could find elements containing bridge data, like this one. So here's an element in an XML language that is able to say that something is a bridge. So it's much more semantically strong than stating that something is a title in uh, HTML or that something is a heading on uh, level one, for example. On the other hand, this is not trivial. If you want to create XML languages that should cover uh, full, uh, well, a domain area, you have to spend quite some time deciding what elements to uh, develop. But experiments are done on this. The second problem that we face on the World Wide Web is that we have a system, internal system problem, which makes it difficult to share data, to compare data and reuse data. That is because uh, the different information systems available on the web may use of their own uh, database schema in the, in the sources that they pull data from, which makes it a bit difficult to combine data from several sources and do, the do a merge of them. Now there are attempts at solving this also with uh, using uh, things like so-called pattern recognition and text string matching and things like that. For example, if you want to uh, search for the cheapest flight from uh, Oslo to, to Vienna, where I flew in, I could use uh, some uh, uh, flight search engine which then scrapes data from different uh, air companies and compares it f for me. So there are solutions to that, but they are not standardized solutions. And that's what we, what we like. Which means, since we don't have standardized solutions, it's often up to the end users themselves to go take uh, data out, compare it, interpret it, connect it with other data sets. So in uh, not too many years ago, you had to, if you wanted to find uh, find uh, uh, flights, you'd have to go into s several different uh, databases and do that comparison, making notes, okay, this one costs uh, 50 euro more than that one, et cetera, et cetera. And that means that the web is uh, leaving, leaving the users to do the, to to pay the cost of communication when it could potentially be possible to solve it using uh, uh, the approach of the semantic web. But whether semantic web is the solution, it's too early to answer that. I, in my point of view, I think that uh, the original when when the semantic web started 
uh, they took a far too advanced uh, point of departure. I think that with the approach uh, using now with the so-called linked data approach is a far better way of attacking the problem. But the semantic web can be a partial solution, but it is necessary as with the XML uh, um, markup to create problems or domain uh, dependent solutions. So general solutions to solving any information need is of course uh, totally uh, impossible. But the semantic web is, what could say, the web for computer applications. So it's not intended to be interpreted by humans. So the data that should be available on the web should be used for uh, interpret interpreting and parsing by uh, software that uh, are able to, to and tailored to um, understanding uh, the data. But the data, the semantic web is sort of an extension of the web because it's building upon the uh, same technologies that are used on the ordinary web. So the infrastructure used for, uh, for um, uh, solving these potential problems is the same infrastructure as you are using when you are uh, uh, reading the newspaper or searching Google or whatever. But the point is that it's a web of data rather than a web of documents. According to the inventor of the web, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, it was always thought to be like that. It was always thought to be a semantic web. Uh, this illustration, which may be a bit difficult to see from behind, is from uh, Berners-Lee's original proposal of the World Wide Web that he presented to CERN in uh, Switzerland when he was working there. And what this illustrates is you can have some documents. You see this document in the middle here, which describes some topic or ID or subject, a proposal mesh, which in turn is describing something to do with CERN, the organization that uh, Berners-Lee was working in. And this CERN has included this document in its collection. The web here is uh, having a document describing the subject of hypertext, which in turn includes the subject of hypermedia. And you see all the arrows here are pointing from, not only from document to other documents, but from documents to IDs, from documents to persons, from persons to ideas from uh, uh, concept to concept, one might say, independent of them being uh, in a written form. And what we did get was a very good solution. We got the World Wide Web out of it, and probably it was wise to have that ambition to deal with documents in the beginning, since this is far more complex than the current web we have. So for building such networks we need to have some some tools for for doing uh, uh, analysis and modeling the world. And that is where so-called ontologies come in. Now an ontology is defined by a uh, uh, man called Tom Grubel as an explicit representation of a conceptualization. And what does he mean by that? He means that it is a way of describing a domain or a world explicitly using some standards, standardized way. So pointing out conceptualizations 
one conceptualization could be a person. So we need to be able to describe persons. We need to be able to describe what persons do. They eat, for example, they drink, they consume. We need to identify what those persons eat, drink or consume, uh, which could be uh, bread, plants, beer, etc. And that's the purpose of the ontologies, is that you have to describe the things that we can know something about. And that is typically done in the form of classes, which contains concepts, abstract things, and concrete things. For example, a man, or man, or human, or animal. We need to have relationships so that we could say that, okay, this animal is a mammal, for example, or this dog is a mammal. We need to be able to describe properties, characteristics of these things. For example, that they have a name. And it is necessary to have some way of controlling that, uh, that the things that we describe are not illogical. So that if, for example, we would have constraint rules and uh, that would state, uh, make it possible to say that, right, we can't uh, have, um, for example, a month can't be more than 31 days long. So if you want to deal with that kind of data, we need to make certain that uh, the system doesn't mess up things. So we need to give as explicit conceptualizations as possible so that the data can be interpreted in a correct way. So how should we create those uh, ontologies and those data? There are four standard technologies in use on the semantic web. All were uh, developed by the World Wide Web Consortium. The first being XML. We have RDF. We have RDF schema. And we have the web ontology language called OWL. Uh, <coughs> XML we have already seen an example of the bridge file that I showed you here. So this is XML. This is the basic building block for creating uh, data on the semantic web. Another example could be to make it certain that someone is an author, for example, Tim Berners-Lee, then we need to have an author element for describing that. On top of that, we have RDF, which is a World Wide Web Consortium standard. Uh, in the web consortium uh, way of talking about things, they called standards for recommendations. So in uh, 1999, they decided that they had developed a, a language for describing things on the semantic web that was good enough. So they made it a recommendation. Here are some links just pointing to where you can find more information about both the RDF and semantic web. The point of uh, RDF is that it's possible to embed metadata in digital documents. And RDF <coughs> is used to describe things which have properties that take value. And this is what in is called a um, triple in uh, the uh, web, uh, semantic web language. So in RDF, when we uh, put things 
out on the semantic web, we do it in the form of describing something called subjects that have some properties that take some values. And preferably, we use URIs or URLs, web addresses in other words, to uh, identify those things that we talk about. We'll show you some examples in a little bit. Now RDF is a domain independent data model describing these triples. For example, it can be used to say that Nils Faro, the thing Nils Faro, has a property he is presenting at somewhere which takes the value of the expert seminar. So this block of expert seminar is where there is a presentation by Nils Faro. And that can be described using RDF. So that's the basic building block. Similarly, we have, if I'm um, not sure how familiar you are with the, uh, relational database theory. No, I hadn't s didn't say that, but if you have any, if you find anything particularly interesting or difficult, you shouldn't hesitate to, to just uh, stop me and ask me a question. Here is an example of some uh, uh data from a relational database. What we find here is information about books. And these can also be represented as triples. For example, can we say that a book is a thing? That book has a property, an ISBN number. And the value it takes is the actual number. Or that a book has an author that takes the value Elaine Svenonius. Or a book has a property, a title, which is everything is miscellaneous. Meaning that all these things in that database uh, can be described on the triple form that is required by the uh, RDF language for, for sharing thing on the semantic web. So the general principle is that we have things with properties that take value. For example, book has a title, everything is miscellaneous. And it's not more complicated than that. So describing things in this way is the basic building stone of the semantic web. So what does it look like? Well, here is an example of a bibliographic um, record, sort of. What we find here is, now I feel I should have some pointing stick, but let's see. <coughs> I'll walk you through this uh, nice piece of code. In the first line, you find the XML declaration. In the, then it says RDF, RDF, and then it comes something called XML and NS, which refers to namespaces, meaning uh, places where you find the so-called metadata schema or ontologies describing uh, the things we use here. Don't worry about that yet. But then it comes RDF description, and then we have a URL. You see it with the O'Reilly.com catalog so and so. Here we describe the thing that we are talking about. Then we see DC title. That's something collected from the Dublin Core uh, metadata schema. Dublin Core is developed for, uh, for light uh, bibliographic description. So this URI with O'Reilly.com, it has a property a title, and that title takes the value information architecture for the World Wide Web. It also has a property, creator, Peter Morville, 
its uh, value. It has another cro uh, a creator property whose value is Lou Rosenfeld and so on. And then we see towards the end of the file that the book also has a property called rev review. And it doesn't take a value in the string form as in the other examples, but it takes a value in the form of a URI as well. And that URI is pointing to another resource, which then also can be described using RDF, like this. So here we are uh, uh, describing the URI that we found at the other slide. Digital Web Com Articles Information Architecture for the World Wide Web 3rd Edition. This thing has its own properties. It has a title on its own, which is a review of information architecture for the World Wide Web. It has a creator, Lee McCusick. It has a publisher, Penlug. And it has other uh, properties taking value as well. And we see that in the final part that it has a, a value, a, a property review of a resource pointing back to the O'Reilly URI. So what we are doing here is establishing a link between the book and the review of the book using RDF as the building block. So RDF is used for describing instances or individuals or things. But in order to create ontologies, classes of things, we need to have something stronger. What we can do with uh, uh, RDF is to say that something is a type. And we can s use it to say that something is an instance of a class. So it's of type class. But to be more, to have a richer uh, a set of, uh, of uh, tools for describing ontologies, we use RDF schema or OWL. An RDF schema is a uh, quite simple uh, ontology language. It is <coughs> developed for defining RDF terminologies and it's as such a type system or a class create class creating system for RDF which means that it can be used for making semantic information machine readable machine accessible an RDF schema is also written in RDF form, so it's the same syntax as we saw when describing this uh, book by, uh, by uh, Rosenfeld and Morwell. But what we can do with RDF schema is to say that if we have a statement, if we have RDF stating that Nils Faro is a teacher of digital knowledge organization, which is a triple, it can also be deduced to say that Okay, not only is this person a teacher of digital knowledge organization, but he also must be a member of the academic staff. And he must be involved somehow with digital knowledge organization. And that we, we solve that by having <coughs> uh, components for defining classes, subclasses, properties and sub-properties. So we can use the RDF schema in order to specify the relationship between uh, individual instances and the classes they're belonging. Uh -huh. Thank you. I feel like singing my... Um <coughs> yeah. 
Ah, ah Phil. Hm. <laughs> yes. Let's take a look at that example. So you came just in time. What we see here is, start over here, referring to the namespaces where RDF and RDF schema are defined. Then we state that the base here is a URL. That's just a way to getting a short form so we don't have to spell out ed ev every URL in its full form all the time. But we can say here that we have a description of a thing which is referred to as an employee. And here we see that this is actually a short form of HTTP example or staff employee. But we can state that this thing employee has a property, it's a type, and the type it is, is a class. So we use RDF schema here, and RDF to state that employee is a class. And then in the next description, we make another statement saying that the thing with the ID teacher is has a, a property that it is a subclass taking the value employee. So we can use this to state that a teacher is a subclass of an employee. Which means that if I use my example on uh, the teacher in the digital knowledge organization, I can have this simple ontology to state that, okay, not only must this person be a teacher, he must also be an employee at the institution. And that can be done without having to specify it more explicitly. It's specified because it's stated here that it, it is a subclass. Now, we could make it much more sophisticated using different uh, uh, elements from our. We could also add something that we call domain and range uh, uh, characteristics of our ontologies, which could be used to say that, okay, the members of a class must come from a specific domain. And when we define properties, we can use it to limit what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, subjects and values can be added into uh, uh, statements. So in order to make sure that our data is not uh, illogically correct. There are, however, also some problems then uh, doing such constraints because you might constrain your data too much and that uh, is also problematic. If we wanted to use OWL, we could use that for example to state that a teacher or an academic staff member must teach at least one course. So we can model that in our, uh, our ontology or that every book must have a title in order to be uh, logically correct. There are, to make things complicated, there are actually three different uh, versions of OWL because the most, uh, the full OWL is so complicated that you need to create subsets of it. What OWL does is to use RDF, RDF schema, and its own terminology to define ontologies. And here are just some references to, to where you could find much more information about OWL. Now, this presentation can be made available. I wouldn't mind that, so if you put it on the web or something. 
So, let's see. The semantic web can be used to facilitate data sharing, data merging, and data reuse. So it's possible to solve those issues that are not as easily solved on the ordinary web with the standard web, uh, world of web uh, technology. But the challenges that we saw, we have to recapitulate on that. We <coughs> state that it's too much noise. It involves large costs of communication. And that is due to we having internal systems that are bad at communicating. So then we end up with the so-called silo problem, which looks like this. can be illustrated this way. What we have here are four different information sources on or systems available on the web. First system, library A, has data in MARC format and among those records stored there, they have a record which has a uh, author called Suzanne Collins. So the field 100 subfield A is the field uh, for authors in MARC. Then we have an uh, information system that a newspaper needs in order to store all its uh, well data about articles, about uh, reviews and so on. And in their system, they have an uh, author field stating that someone called Suzanne Collins is uh, has a role as an author in the newspaper. Then we could have a bookstore. And uh, bookstores have their own metadata system. Uh, they have a field in that system called A01 which is used to sp uh, specify that someone is an author. And then finally you could have a system, there's a video rental, but it could be Netflix for example. Netflix needs to have information about uh, who's the creator of, uh, of uh, the documents. So in this case, let's say that uh, the system has an information about who's written a script, stating script by Collins. And this is, of course, dealing with the same person which has, uh, of which there is information in four different sources, but these sources all have metadata in different formats, which makes it difficult to collect data from all of them. So that if you wish to make a couple coupling between for example, if there's a review of the author Suzanne Collins, uh, who's written these Hunger Games books, um, and you want to couple that with your library data so that you could use it in promoting uh, the collection, it is a bit difficult. And also, if you want to couple the, uh, the book version with the movie, it is also difficult when they are using different uh, metadata standards. <coughs> and that is why we try to, why Tim Berners-Lee tried to promote this use of the semantic web for linking up your data to in order to solve this silo problem. So the main point being that you should make your data available in RDF format, as I've just shown you, and linking them to other existing data so that it is possible to enrich your data and other data. Uh, it says Sparkle endpoints. Uh, Sparkle is a way of querying uh, semantic web data. And for example, 
you don't necessarily have to have your data as RDF, but you could just expose them in your system. So if you have a relational database of some kind, but you make it possible to query RDF and get out that out of it using Sparkle, then you are uh, fulfilling your obligations, so to speak. And the idea of linked data is to use uh, standard web technologies, the semantic web, for distributing information. And it is done using uh, URIs, or which stands for Uniform <coughs> Resource uh, Identifiers, but which in practice would be URLs, meaning uh, web addresses. And preferably using HTTP URLs so that people can look up and find the data, and look up the names. And when someone does look up your data, it should be available, preferably using the standards, which I've already talked more than enough about RDF. And then make that data available with links to other data sets. So if you do so, you are uh, close to um supporting the um uh, could say and get a five star nice linked data out of it because what uh has been uh as i said when the semantic web approach uh, first started it was very much a top down approach but using the linked data approach, you say that, okay, you don't have to create very sophisticated ontologies and, uh, and, uh, and uh, make uh, them uh, very enriched by RDF. But we want you to make your data openly available, preferably, it says, in a machine-readable format, so if they're all openly available, and if it's just a picture of your um, of your um, catalog card, for example, I it's still linked open data, but uh, the data is not in a very good format. If you make it form uh, available in machine-readable form, that's one step closer to the ideal. If you make them f available in non-proprietary formats, meaning instead of using uh, uh, Word, for example, you'd rather use uh, an open standard, like uh, have it uh, in, uh, in uh, ASCII text or whatever. But preferably using RDF as the source of your data, because when it is in RDF, it is also understandable by others using RDF. And adding links which would be the perfect. Because if you don't link it, it still will be so uh, in silos unless others find them and link to it. So linked data, in that sense, means connecting data sets. And there are quite a few data sets linked together. What we see here is uh, the so-called linked open data cloud, which contains, which is an illustration of uh, the data that are available in RDF following the standards that uh, just uh, prescribe the, or the goals. And we see here, uh, illustrated by color, different domains that are available in uh, uh, RDF as linked data. If for example, the part over here 
are publication data. So in the publication data, you'd find, uh, among other things, quite a few library data sets. Here you'll find some that are cross-domain. Up here you'll find some uh, data sets from media. And if you go into the details, which I intend to give you a little example of. Let's see, opens in the background, I presume. So, now it gets a bit tricky when I add. Let's see if we can make it anyway. So, here are the data sets that has been accepted as good enough to be shown in the linked open data cloud. Um <coughs> now we're somewhere in the, in the uh, publication domain. So you can see here that we have, for example, data from uh, from WorldCat. We have a due decimal classification on top there. We have um, Princeton Library finding aids. We have a thesaurus for economics. We have WordNet and things like that. So an LCH LCSH is uh, Library of Congress subject headings. So they are also available in uh, in uh, linked data. Oh, I had tried one example earlier today, so hopefully it works now as well. This is the German uh, National Library. They have uh, put out their uh, uh, national bi bibliography as, uh, as RDF. And... Um what was it What's on the article? Yeah. This worked earlier at least. So what we find here j are just some examples of their data so we can see what it looks like to see if this makes sense when we relate to what we talked about earlier. And it does because here we see an example of an article uh, published in uh, some German uh, uh journal I guess and if you see here you have nice RDF describing things identified by URIs and the things they describe contain some properties for example it has a title it has a creator, it has actually two creators. The title is given here, Ultraschall by Kindern, eine fantastische Untersuchungsmethode. It has some creators which are identified by URIs, which then can be looked up. And you could look up these creators and then you would find references to all the other articles these uh, authors have written. And you can find what journal it's been published in as well. So in this way, the German National uh, Library has put out ho their whole collection of articles and books at a certain point of time. As far as I understood, uh, this is a data dump they did at, s at one point. The alternative would have been if they had it all accessible in as a Sparkle endpoints, it would be dynamically on the fly updated. Hmm. Um, there we are, I hope. So, to get included in this data cloud, this should then be the goal of data providers, in my view. So just an example. How do you get linked data?
So this is just showing how exhibitionistic I am because I use uh, a reference to myself and uh, me playing in the band. The point here is that I use URIs to represent in, uh, me as a person with uh, an in the in the left hand side, saying that this thing identified there has a property m o member of which takes a value with another URI for the band I play in. And here we also link to something outside of uh, the... Uh, no, I'm sorry. Here we also point to something called music ontology. And that is because we use the member of uh, uh, property collected from a source which is called music ontology. And <coughs> the purpose of linked data is to reuse data. And we would like to uh, use different types of links when we are linking the data. We want to use relationship links, we use identity links and vocabulary links. So for example, in a relationship link. We could use, as shown here, we say that the URL hua.no, which is the uh, URL, URL representing my, uh, my institution in uh, Oslo, it has a property which says fov spec based near, which means that we have used a property from uh, an ontology which describes things that uh, that can be uh, based near one another. So we use that uh, uh, element to state that this is near, and then we pick a data from something called DBpedia, which describes the city of Oslo. So the first is actually an example of using the FOF, which is a vocabulary which the acronym FOF stands for, friend of a friend. And it was developed for, for describing social relations. But uh, as it has turned out, it is also very much used for describing uh, person information and organization information because it's a robust and uh, has been a stable system. So we use other uh, data sets for describing the things that we do, because there's no point in remodeling uh, the world that has already been nicely modeled. That's the point here. Now in this case, we use <coughs> uh, we establish a triple stating that Oslo, collected from this DBpedia, is the, and they have used OWL, the, the Bontology language, to state that this is the same as, and then we point to another URI from something called GeoNames. And the point here is to state that Oslo, the thing pointed to in the first uh, part of the triple is the same as the thing pointed to in the third part of the triple. So it makes it possible to, to facilitate different opinions, different descriptions of the same thing. It makes it possible to trace, to, to, to be certain that may make a certain what we are talking about. If more sources represent the same thing, it's possible to say, okay, this must be about Oslo. Yeah. Mm. And it secures robustness because it makes it possible to make assumption about a thing without all uh, sources on the s on the in the linked data are available. So it's possible to find out about Oslo even if this DBpedia is not, uh, does not have the data at this time. Let's 
see here we are because <coughs> And we saw that we used the dbpedia and G geo names. And if we take uh, another look at this uh, cloud diagram, we see that in the middle of the whole cloud, we find actually geo names and dbpedia. They are larger than the others, which means they are much more in use than the others. So these are the two most popular sources on, uh, on the semantic web, one could say. And DBpedia is a uh, RDF version of Wikipedia. It doesn't contain everything in Wikipedia, but it contains the, the fact information in Wikipedia, which is uh, very valuable. And GeoNames is a system for describing geographic locations which is also very popular to use because uh, many things has a place. And then we also have some examples of vocabulary links. And that's what I said. To it's better to reuse other vocabularies than creating your own if there exists other vocabularies and as at this stage there are lots and lots of vocabularies so few of us really need to do ontology modeling as such but we need to find identify what are the best ways of describing our domains and then it's possible to create mappings if you have to create your own ontology your own schema you may create mappings between the terms for example, using OWL again, something called OWL equivalent class to state that, okay, in I had to create a system which makes it possible to describe authors, for example. But in order for others to, uh, to have a, a value out of it, I just point out that, okay, my author is actually equivalent to the creator that uh, is used in the um, Dublin core. And that's what we see here in this uh, egoistic example, pointing from uh, using the property collected from the music ontology is much better than me creating a uh, such a property myself. Okay, I thought I would end this lecture before you have any questions and I can provide some answer with just showing a little example of the library world because as you saw there were lots of publication data sets one way that linked data and RDF is tried to be implemented in libraries is through the use of the bib frame uh, model. So are you familiar with the bib frame? Anyone? No? Okay. Yes, that's one. Ah, good. You heard about it earlier today, I presume. Hmm? Uh, bib frame is thought to be the follow-up of Mark. So BibFrame is a way for describing bibliographic data in a new format, which makes it possible to take into account modern technology uh, that is much more flexible than uh, Mark. You heard of Mark, I guess. But the BibFrame model, the basics of the BibFrame model is to state that what we are describing when we are describing bibliographic data are works which has to do with the intellectual content of the things we describe. For example, uh, the um, Macbeth by Shakespeare is a work and we know that that work has a creator, Shakespeare, 
and we know that it has a subject, for example, uh, the the king of uh, Denmark or Dan Danish royals. Now this work, this ID is independent of the physical embodiment of the work. So we can create that data uh, describing the work independent of any document, any physical item containing Macbeth. But of course in a collection we have lots of instances, as they are called here, which are different versions perhaps of the work Macbeth. For example, the, copy, the uh, paperback uh, copy, the uh, illustrated Czech copy, the instance, the audio book, the <coughs> critical, um, uh, well, not the critical, but the original manuscript in um, uh, um, uh, recreated using uh, some sort of uh, magical going back to the 16th century uh, method. Lots and lots of different instances of this work exist. But in the Bib Frame project, the Bib Frame model, they try to separate the description of the content from the description of all those physical items. Now this is of course strongly related to the to the Ferber model. No, Ferber, which is uh, the functional requirement for bibliographic records, which was uh, um, came out as a report from IFLA in the late 1990s, postulated that you should create better cataloging systems that made it unnecessary to have so much redundancy in the databases. So you didn't have to say that Macbeth is written by Shakespeare more than one time. So as it is today in the Mark records, if you have 100 Macbeths in your uh, collection, you also have 100 times written that Shakespeare is the author of Macbeth. That shouldn't be necessary. And with the modern uh, uh modern database model, it is possible to solve that in other ways. And <coughs> the Library of Congress, which is behind the, the Bib Frame model, they have decided that this should be based on a linked data approach. So the data in the um, Bib Frame should be accessible uh, as linked open data. Though Bib Frame is far from being implemented yet. But there are some nice um, examples of uh, of how it will, what it will look like available on the on the um, Bibframe website. For example, so if you look here, it is possible to take a look at the uh, initiative, the model and vocabulary, for example. And <coughs> here it's possible to also uh, find, let me see, somewhere there's an editor for uh, testing out how a uh, bib frame should, uh, should be used, maybe on the implementation part. But also, they have might be here actually. Provided examples, well here's the Bibframe editor, which can be used both uh, online on the web and it's also possible to download it to test it on your own. And then they also have several solutions for seeing how, what would mark data, old school uh, library data look like in, um, in uh, the bib frame model. So when they are uh, presenting this on the uh, website and in their FAQ, they say that this is not yet implementable, but it gives 
uh, indication, strong indication on how uh, library data will be stored in the, in the future. And from my view, at least, it will be much more um, flexible than the current MARC records are. The problem we face, of course, is that we have uh, data stored in a format developed uh, in the late 1960s. So there are literally billions of records that somehow either needs to be converted to a new format or it must be possible to reuse that data when you have the new data in another format. But um, there are some potentially exciting times for that. And that, my dear friends, was what I was going to tell you about today. But if you have any questions, I'm very happy to try to answer them. Shocked and stunned. Yes, that's a good question. I could, I think I will, uh, let's see, home. Mm -hmm. There is a FAQ for BibFrame, which say something about it, I hope. Uh, and what they say here is, um, uh, when should we move to BibFrame? So it says that it's far from an environment that you could move to yet. <laughs> The model and its components are still in discussion and development. Of course, um, I'm not sure what the situation is here uh, about uh, RDA, which is thought to be uh, the successor of the AACR2 cataloging rules. But uh, RDA will is at least in Norway, it's under uh, uh, under translation from uh, from American or from English to Norwegian and probably they will start using our day based on the uh, on the old ma mark platform but I would think that in a few years it might be possible to to move to big frame but um, still under development it says good question Mm. Um, linked data is used in um, has been used as uh, basic infrastructure in quite a few uh, websites so for example I know that and it's whether it's of help or not I'm not sure but uh, during the London Olympics the BBC used uh, uh, used uh, linked data and RDF to build up their whole technological infrastructure for sharing data so you could get uh, information about s sports athletes in linked data coupling them to uh, to uh, programs events etc so there are uses of it uh, the challenge I would say about linked data as such is that if you if you if you try to store it all in RDF then it gets quite uh, the the data transmission gets quite slow because you, you it is not as efficient as having it in an ordinary database. So the, the point of having them available to query them using this Sparkle is, uh, is uh, probably the currently the optimal solution. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your effort and time uh, for, uh, being here. Okay. And I have uh, two small uh, presents. First, 
this is the book. Uh, it's called Punks Not Dead. <laughs> uh, it's about punk culture in the Czech Republic. But the problem is in Czech language. Well, uh, uh, inspire me. Uh, there is a small present uh, uh, of liquor. Uh -huh. okay. So hopefully you can take it to the play. I I'm not sure. Uh, we'll see. Or I'll do drink it on the bus tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I wish you a pleasant journey and uh, uh, tomorrow we will have a concert. So uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.